Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. What's up, Touch MBA fam? How are you guys doing? I hope you're doing great. Welcome to the show. This week I spoke with Sabina Kamara, who came to Touch MBA over a year ago to get some free school selection help. She was uh, an avid listener of the show, and uh, throughout the past year, you know, I've watched her retool her application and apply to great schools and get into great schools. And eventually, she'll she got into Michigan Ross, where she'll be attending this fall. So in this podcast, Sabina and I talk about her journey from how she crafted her and changed her career goals to which schools she selected and why to how she applied to a number of those schools through the consortium and and what the consortium is and uh, how that could benefit many of you. Obviously, it makes me very proud to hear when listeners of the show get into their dream schools. So uh, I just hope you enjoy it and can really learn from from Sabina's lessons. It's almost like this episode is a cheat sheet summary to you know hundreds of our episodes because uh, Sabina used many of the techniques we've we've discussed on, on the show to improve her application. During the episode, at one point we talked about you know her her best tips on essays, and she's like, well, why don't I just you know share some of the essays I wrote with the listeners? So you can find these essays at touchmba.com/slash. Sabina, and that's S-A-B-A-I-N-A. I'd also like to talk about our sponsor. Save up to $13,000 with a low interest MBA loan from Common Bond. Common Bond has funded over a billion dollars in student loans and their easy online application only takes minutes. To learn more, visit commonbond.co slash touchmba. That's Common Bond Lending, LLC, and MLS number 1175900. So yeah, I hope you enjoy this episode. Be sure to take advantage of uh, our services as Sabina did, whether that's the podcasts, which you're listening to now, um, our free school selection help service at touchmba.com or our admissions edge uh, forum and course where you can get feedback from me on your application while you apply just to get some guidance um, and, and an extra set of uh, eyes on your application. That's at touchmba.com slash course. All right, and now to my conversation with Sabana Kamara. Uh, our next guest will be headed to Michigan Ross this fall. So I'd like to welcome Sabina to the show. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's great to, to as you know, to um, meet and, and to talk here and to kind of recap your, your application journey. Yes. Would you mind giving us just a quick introduction of yourself? Okay. Well, my name is Sabina Kamara. I graduated with a BA in economics from the University of Maryland in 2012. Since then, I've been working in the legal realm, regulatory um, space for diversity and inclusion as a human resources analyst. Um, so I work in a lot of diversity issues and things like that. And as you know, I'm headed to um, Ross School of Business, class of 2019. So I'm super excited for that experience. So am I. So am I. And I can't wait to learn more about your experience. So, you know, let's focus this talk on crafting your story and presenting your best self. Um, and I'd, I'd like to pay special attention to, you know, how you crafted your career goals, which schools you started with and which you ended up selecting to apply to and other elements of your application, like uh, your resume and your essays and interview and so forth. But let's first start with your career goals. So when you came to us, your career goal was to get into analytics, right? And to work for a technology company in the West or East Coast. And of course, now we know you're, you're heading to Ross. So I, I'd like to discuss, you know, how did that career goal change throughout your application process? 
Well, um, first and foremost, um, I'd like to thank you first, Darren, for that, because you really helped me to really craft that story that spoke to uh, my passions and, you know, what I believe that I could contribute to the community that I joined for my MBA. So, of course, you know, I wanted to go into like an, an analytics function um, in the high tech industry, um, of course, given my background in analytics for diversity in a law firm. So I kind of thought it made the most sense. Um, because I also had an interest in the tech industry. But um, after doing a lot of research and listening to your podcast and also having an e-conversation with you on the Admissions Edge platform, you know, I kind of thought that the best story would be, of course, one that related to my professional background, which is something that you stated as well, um, which is HR and diversity inclusion, and also spoke to my passion for diversity as well. So it kind of uh, my story kind of developed from that. So I ended up, you know, saying that, well, not saying, but just having a story that really spoke to my, my professional background in um, diversity and inclusion, to my passion for diversity, and to my interest in consulting, and kind of put that all together to say that I wanted to target a human capital consulting role in an internal function for a high-tech company post-MBA. So it was, it kind of all came together. Mm. Uh, yeah, so it kind of all came together and also, you know, listening to you again, your podcast and how we kind of talked about, well, how you kind of talked about, um, you know, having a kind of a grand plan type thing as to what my long term goals would be. And I and I really again, I I'm really passionate about diversity and inclusion. So my grand plan was, of course, to improve the diversity in the high tech sector, um, given the discussions and problems that I saw with my current clients in the legal space that I'm in right now. So it was really cool to kind of develop that. And also, again, thank you <laughs> for providing that information. It was really helpful. No, of course. But I'm curious, how much did the schools push you on this? Like, of course, you probably describe these in your essays, right? But when it came to the interviews, did they really push you on like, you know, OK, what do you want to do post MBA? Like, did they push you further than what you just told me? No, they didn't. And I think it was because I I was so passionate about yeah. what I was talking about. It wasn't just, you know, something that I, you know, kind of pulled out of thin air. It was more so something that I was truly passionate about that I could see myself doing in the long run and something that um, I was interested in. So, and also because, you know, my professional background was in that area as well. So I didn't get um, pushback during the interview process. And I'd also kind of taken it the next step to talk to admissions officers at my select schools. And also, of course, have those discussions with them regarding diversity within their own or, um, institutions. Because again, that was something I'm really passionate about. So I, I don't think that pushback would have been there, I guess, as far as their yeah, as far as like their standpoint. Um, but as far as, of course, the interviews, I didn't get pushed back at all. I was just, you know, knowledgeable about the issues that I saw in the tech industry because of, again, discussions that we were having um, within my organization and the, you know, data that I was looking at for my own clients. So basically, like based on that information, I was able to show that I was well informed on the industry, uh, not problems, but challenges that um, technology companies are having with regard to diversity and inclusion. Yeah, no, and, and I love that. And it's I can hear it in your voice right now that, you know, you can speak to what you want to do passionately and intelligently. Right. And I think that's very much what the schools are looking for. I, I think, of course, they know people will come in and perhaps be inspired by this professor or this course or, you know, this activity and maybe change their goals. But I think they do want to hear at least up to now you know, what, what your path forward is. Let's talk about school, your, your school selection. In preparing for this podcast, I was looking at your original schools. Yeah. Um, you had, <laughs> you had uh, NYU, uh, yep. Tepper, Carnegie Mellon Tepper, Emory Gazetta, Georgetown McDonough, Northwestern Kellogg, and Michigan Ross. And, and at the time you were looking, again, for a collaborative, inclusive, community-based type of program, right, uh, that offered business analytics, which is what you're interested in and, you know, was a diverse uh, community, had a diverse community. You ended up applying to Emory, Northwestern, Ross, Fuqua, and Darden. Yes, right? and Dartmouth as well. And Dartmouth. I also, yes. I could talk, yeah. So how did that change 
throughout your, your school research process? And, you know, why did some of those schools fall off the list and some of those schools, you know, got added to the list? I think really what it was was just, of course, that research aspect on it to it. So um, that initial list was based on the school selection service that you provided. And I kind of um, kind of use that as my standing point, like, hey, I'm really interested in a in a collaborative, close knit community. And I know and I knew that going to a top tier, you know, a top 15 or so business school, I would get, you know, a a phenomenal um, educational experience. But for me, it was really, you know, will I connect with my peers? So, yeah. So what came from that initial list was just kind of to narrow it down a little bit in terms of, okay, let's start looking into the programs, what I'm really interested in, of course, um, with regard to the community aspect and getting in touch with students. So after that, the list kind of just expanded and contracted. (laughs) (laughs) So it was like, you know, yeah, so it was like, you know, McDonough was out, Stern was out, and like all of these other, um, Carnegie Mellon, Tepper was out. And then I switched them in for like, you know, UVA, Tuck, Fuqua, Ross, and and uh, of course, Northwestern was already there, and Emory was already there. So it, it just kind of expanded and contracted based on, you know, the research that I was doing on the schools and um, the connections that I was making with the students. Which, which was... The most important there was it the connection with the students that led to the schools or was it the research on the schools i think first it was the research on the schools um to kind of figure out whether or not i could see myself there in terms of you know just reviewing their website reviewing you know the opportunities that they have and whether or not their program spoke to me and then um, once I got my list down, then I started to target the schools with regard to talking to students, um, attending information sessions, and um, getting in touch with admissions officers. And I know you ended up applying to three of those schools through the consortium, right? Right, so I applied to Emory, Dartmouth, UVA, and uh, Michigan through the consortium. Got it. Okay, so maybe let's take a step back because some of our listeners might not know what the consortium is. So could you like sum it up for our listeners? Yeah, so in a nutshell, the consortium is basically an organization of 18 member schools that has a mission to improve the um, number of underrepresented minorities in business and leadership. So in order to apply to this, you can be of any race, any sex, whatever. The most important thing is that you have to show um, a commitment to underrepresented minorities with regard to, you know, things that you've done in the past, maybe, you know, volunteering experience, Teach for America, whatever the case might be, things that you're doing currently to show that you have a commitment to underrepresented minorities and improving, you know, leadership business type things and um, or maybe even the educational space and then things that you plan on doing in the future to continue that mission. I mean, is it a pretty high bar to show that commitment? For example, you were working, right, for three or four years, right, to, to, to build up diversity in the workforce. Like, does it need to be that extensive or could it be, for example, something more of an extracurricular activity for you? Exactly. It could have been an extracurricular activity. So my um, so this was actually a perfect fit for me, again, because I was already interested in diversity. Um, I am a woman of color. (laughs) And also um, because I did have past experience through extracurricular activities during my undergrad that show that commitment. So it could be the same thing. So you have, you know, a strong level of um, commitment to underrepresented minorities in the undergraduate space, you know, as an undergraduate student, maybe currently, of of course, you're probably working in like private equity or whatever it is that you're doing, but your extracurricular activity or your volunteering um, experience basically seeks to promote uh, maybe ed- the education of underrepresented minorities, um, maybe your mentoring um, underrepresented minorities, whatever the case might be, to show that you have a commitment to that uh, to those um, t- people, basically. And then, of course, your future goals, like how you plan to integrate that within your work. So is there like an application process itself to the consortium before you use it to apply to to your member the member schools 
So what happens is that um, for the application process, you get it, it's really cool because there's also this cost benefit um, part about it. You can apply to like, you know, a specific number of schools for like a specific amount. So I applied to four schools for a total of two hundred and forty dollars. So that was amazing. That's a huge. Um, but yeah, let's let's make that clear. So that's a huge saving on what the application would cost in totality if you had just gone to the schools themselves, right? So you're exactly. basically saving money on the application fee costs. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's like you're spending $240 to apply to four schools as opposed to spending $250 to apply to one. Yeah. <laughs> so there it's, you go. It's, it's, yeah. Right. It's a wonderful bundle service. Um, so, of course, you apply through the consortium, but the applications um, process is the following. You apply um, to the school through the consortium. So you answer whatever the school's essays are. And then you also um, prov- like answer a consortium specific question. So here is where the membership aspect comes in. The consortium specific essays have to do with what you've done in the past, how you want to continue to, um, you know, build this mission that the consortium have. So that's where you speak to these experiences, experiences that you've had that have positively impacted the lives of underrepresented minorities in some way. So that's really the process. So it's like you're applying to the school specifically, but you then have to develop an essay that basically speaks to what you plan to do or what you did in the past that speaks directly to that mission for the consortium. That's how you get membership. And that's that's one essay for no matter how many schools you're applying to. Right. Right. And that's for the consortium specific essay. But the schools, yeah, if you're applying to four schools, you might have to, you know, develop four (laughs) essays depending on what the schools want. But separately for the consortium, there is one essay that you would have to do for them. Yes. And I I mean, I saw they also award on the website, they said hundreds of merit-based scholarships. Mm -hmm. You know, 70% of consortium members are offered some sort of scholarship. And, you know, they have like corporate partners and of course like thousands of alumni now uh, close to 10,000 yeah I mean how else have you interacted with with that group like have you already met for example people that have gotten in this year like you like yourself yeah so what happens is once you are of course accepted into your program and you're um, you know you've been admitted and you've I guess you know said whether or not you're gonna come so you've committed at that point we have several group me <laughs> chats that basically for the consortium group so it's kind of to bring the entire consortium class at this point we're at about I think 476 members. Yeah. that committed to consortium schools this year. It's I think it's still growing, but I'm not quite sure. So um, basically what it is, is we have like, you know, a group chat with all of the other members and we're kind of basically just getting to know each other. If you're in the same town, city as like, you know, other members, um, people are, you know, kind of coming up with happy hours or brunches or whatever, just to kind of, you know, further integrate within um, that cohort. And then we have our orientation program at the, in the beginning of June. So that's when, you know, we all get together as consorti- as the entire consortium class, you know, by school and things like that to really, of course, integrate, get to know each other, but then also, you know, hitting the job market as far as um, getting, getting access to the partner corporations and kind of have that early access prior to recruiting. I think it's such a great idea at like, you know, beginning to end how this could benefit you guys, the schools, you know, consortium members, the schools and, and the corporations. I wanted to ask you why like you applied to those three schools. You said Emory, UVA and Ross, right? Or did I miss one? Dartmouth. Dartmouth <laughs> and Dartmouth yes. um, through the consortium as opposed to your, your other schools. So Emory, Dartmouth, UVA and Michigan are consortium member schools, but Northwestern, Fuqua, yeah, Northwestern and Fuqua are not um, consortium schools. So that was the difference. Ah, that's, I just uh, assumed they were. <laughs> I mean, no, that's, no, that's, no, no. that's I know, crazy. Yeah. I just assumed they, they were part of it. Wow. Okay. Yeah, the school is an 18 member um, organization, like with schools. So it includes, I believe, Berkeley, Yale, Cornell, uh, Michigan, of course, uh, McDonough. So Georgetown, you have Stern, and you have you know, several other schools, UNC. So you have a total of 18 of the top 20 schools. Okay. Yeah. So I'll be sure to uh, link to that list of schools in the show notes so other people can check out that list and also the consortium. 
when you apply to these, all, the schools you eventually applied to, how much did that career story that we discussed at the beginning of the podcast change or adjust based on what the school offering was and what you saw was unique about each school? Or did it relatively say, stay similar? It actually stayed the same. Um, and it stayed the same because, again, I tried to stay as true to myself as possible. <laughs> and I wanted, to, I wanted to send a consistent message that um, really showed my passion. So um, because of that consistency, I just made sure that, you know, I knew my story in and out. And, you know, when talking to, of course, the admissions officers or students, I didn't change it up. I kept it the same the entire time um, because you don't want to kind of mess up at the interview process. And you, ap you, you applied with this story, but then you're talking about something else. So you want to stay consistent throughout the process. Yeah, that that yeah, that was kind of my way of getting that message out. <laughs> Just <laughs> sorry. It was kind of like a rhetorical question. But yeah, um, oh. <laughs> yeah, definitely you want to. Because that's the, the whole point of the self-reflection exercise and the school research at the beginning, right? Is to really yeah. be authentic and clear with what you want to do. Um, and I think that's just a lesson in whatever you're doing. Yeah, and that's really helpful. When three MBAs struggled with student loans, they knew there had to be a better way. So they created one. Now, Common Bond is a leading student lender, saving members up to $13,000 on MBA loans. Learn more at commonbond.co slash touch MBA. Common Bond Lending, LLC, NMLS number 11759000. I also wanted to take this chance to talk about two of our communities that Sabina is a part of that might benefit you. The first is our Admissions Edge course and forum where you can get uh, expert application help while you apply for a fraction of the cost that you would pay an admissions consultant. That's at touchmba.com course. Also, if you want to get real MBA student insights into what these top programs are really like, go ahead. Did I say really enough? <laughs> Go head over to ambassadors.touchmba.com. Sabina will be our Michigan Ross ambassador there. You can ask her questions about her experience um, if you're interested in applying to Ross. And of course, we have you know over 20 ambassadors to other schools there as well. So that's ambassadors.touchmba.com. Now back to our chat. Let's do like a little quick, quick uh, round here. Uh, we're going to cover some different parts of the application, and I just love to hear your your best tip. Okay, uh, so GMAT. Oh, GMAT. <laughs> um, don't stress. And <laughs> Darren, you could probably attest to my questions in the admissions edge. Um, platform about the GMAT. Like I was stressing. And um, I guess my best tip is to really just don't stress, um, you know, practice hard, you know, um, be dedicated in your studies. But at the end of the, day, of the day, you know, when you get to a score that you're comfortable with, just run with it and build your story from there. Yeah, because we I mean, you retook the GMAT three times or four times? I, I retook it four times. Four times. So when did you decide... Like for you personally, like when did you decide, okay, the score is, is what I'm going to move forward with? It was basically when my score hadn't changed. <laughs> um, it was kind of like a diminishing returns type thing at that point. Um, and I wasn't getting any better. <laughs> so it was at that point that I just had to say, you know what, this is what it is. Now let me really focus on my story. Okay, great. That's good for the GMAT. What about resume? We were <laughs> Your best tip on the resume. Oh, okay. So we went over that as well. <laughs> For me specifically, I had a lot of um, industry specific jargon in there. You know, the type of work that I do, again, has to do with kind of the legal slash, you know, regulatory space for diversity and inclusion. 
So the types of, you know, the types of um, programs that I was developing for our, our clients were really niche, you know, very specific to the industry. So I had to really learn how to flesh that out a bit. And also I learned also how to show that impact, you know, like it was hard to show, you know, a number in terms of like quantifying your impact. It was difficult for me to do that because, you know, I wasn't working as a sales, you know, in sales or marketing, whatever the case might be, where it was easy to get those numbers. So um, I just tried to figure out the best way that I could quantify. And for me, it was based on data, you know, quantifying the number of um, people in the, you know, data sets that I was working on and how that impacted um, certain reports that I had to develop for, you know, certain compliance requirements. So just kind of thinking like that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, could you give an example? If Again, I work with a lot of data sets in terms of our clients, and this is like their workforce data. So one of our largest clients has like about 8,500 employees. And I had to basically figure out a way to report that data to um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, <laughs> so to the government, and it has to be accurate. So um, I did write a one-liner of how I developed um, an Excel macro using the Visual Basic um, language in Excel to basically report this data, which was, you know, which housed 8,500 um, employees to the government and how that resulted in the client um, basically, you know, saying that they wanted me to work on their file from now on, um, which included, you know, an additional 25, you know, compliance programs that our firm would be working on. So I tried to figure out the best way that I could quantify what I was working on <laughs> that shows impact. In some way. And it does, like, and no, it's, it's beautiful because I think when you first came to us, like, that line was something like developed Excel macros for, for Fortune 20 client. And I was like, you got to go further with that, right? <laughs> you got to make, make that bullet count. And, uh, you know, you did a great job with your resume and, and you really um, made it really outstanding and, like, really just brought out your impact, like you said, right? It's not like that you didn't do these things. It's just saying it in a way that an admissions officer like me or that I used to be could could quickly kind of grasp okay like what you've done but also the impact you made I, I'm wondering like during the interview process uh, how in depth <clears throat> how in depth the schools went into your resume they actually they actually did not go um, go deep in that so and I was really shocked because I was of course prepared to talk about those bullets but it was more so geared toward leadership. You know, leadership, you know, the time that, you know, you worked on a team or the time that you worked with a, you know, team member that was difficult to work with or challenging and how did you get through that? So it was more so like team-based questions, team-based behavioral questions, and also leadership questions. You did, how many interviews did you do? So I interviewed, um, I actually interviewed for all of my schools. Awesome. I'm assuming by the sixth school, <laughs> You're kind of like, I got this. I mean, you know, yeah, like you're kind of used to the format, right? Like your stories are a little more honed. Absolutely, um, absolutely. So, yeah, what advice would you give to someone, you know, who was like you, you know, one year ago? Oh, my gosh. Like, like what story should I should I prepare? Should I tell? Like, what, what's your best advice there in terms of preparing leadership and teamwork stories for your interviews? Well, my best advice would be just to really look back at um, the projects that you've worked on, the most impact that you've had, and also looking at those bullets on your resume that show that impact, um, and then working on your star story. So that situation, task, action, and result. So working in that format to like, you know, kind of um, illustrate what you've done and how you impacted the firm in some way, but also, you know, don't really think too hard <laughs> on it because and and one thing that I did find my first interview was actually with Kellogg and I was you know tripping out <laughs> because it was the first interview and I I didn't know what to expect so I spent so many hours you know practicing but by the time I got to my second interview, it was like, you know, I'm not going to spend that much time on this, you know, four hours tops <laughs> because, you know, I, I know my story, you know, internally is just, you know, getting it out there and saying it in a way that kind of shows that direct impact, being prepared for any follow-up question, which of course goes back to knowing your story 
And then also being prepared to answer, you know, why do you want to come to this school? And what impact will you have at this school? What, you know, clubs do you want to be a part of? So having, you know, answers for those questions um, specifically for the school um, was really important. And that's where, of course, like my notes from like talks with client with um, with the with students and talks with um, the admissions officers came in. And I, and I almost said clients because I really used those conversations like it was a client conversation. So it's almost like you prepared like a one page cheat sheet for yourself for each school. Would that be fair to say? Like you had like interactions with people from the school and whatever else in there? Yep, absolutely. And on my way to the interviews, I reread, you know, my cheat sheet and I reread, you know, the conversations that I've had with the students and a, and admissions officers that really struck to me and that I would love to talk about during the interview. In that first interview, when you were like, you know, freaking out, it's your first one, it's with Kellogg, great school, obviously. Like, what do you think the difference was between that interview and then a school you did later on, like, say, Ross, that you eventually ended up going to? Like, was it that you were more robotic with your answers? Or I'm just guessing, but yeah, what, what, what do you think it is? I think really what it was, was, yes, I was um, a bit robotic, but I was also really nervous. And because I was nervous, I wasn't my true self. And, and I think that that really did hold me back um, in that interview. But by the time I got to like Michigan and Fuqua and Tuck, you know, and of course, Darwin, um, I'd already kind of, you know, realized that, hey, you know, you're not a robotic person. You're filled with passion. Let them see that. So I kind of just really honed in on just being myself throughout the entire part of um, the process. That's great. No, that's awesome. Essays. What's your best tip on, 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 on those essays? Those darned essays. Ooh, I actually love the essay portion. I, I have to say, um, just to write your best story. I mean, just kind of think really deeply about, you know, why you want to go to business school. Like what, what's the driving force behind that, what you want to do with it and how you want to impact or change the world with it. So, um, I kind of really just thought about all of that and how my story fit into like those three points and then kind of just flowed from there. <laughs> and I, I took it and, and I do remember again, like I have been listening to your, your podcast touch MBAs for like, like ever since I got in touch with you, like I listen to every single episode. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, um, that's a lot of time with my voice. I'm sorry about that. Seriously, like I was literally <laughs> in at work, like listening to it, and it was really helpful because I was able to understand, you know, what types of story, what type of story um, teller I am. Like I'm, you know, I like to speak in, well, write in narrative, you know, as opposed to kind of writing those very bland essays that really don't incite an emotion or whatever the case might be. So um, because I knew that I love to write stories, I love to, you know, write in prose, essentially. That's what I did. You're a poet. You're a poet. We can tell the listeners you write poetry. <laughs> I, yes, I write poetry. <laughs> So I just chose to kind of hone in on that skill set and just write a, like, write a really good story for folks. I mean, okay, so I, I have to go deeper there, right? Because so when you say a good story, like, and you mentioned those three things like that you always had in the back of your mind, can you give an example of how you would do that in an essay? For Darden's essay, I think I actually had the most fun with that one. And that one basically asked for professional feedback that you've received. Okay. And of course, like that's like such a bland question. You're like, professional feedback? Oh my gosh, how am I going to write to this and make it interesting? So I basically wrote a story and I started off um, kind of speaking from my director's voice um, in terms of having like a direct quote from her as to, you know, what it is that she expected from me as an analyst, but also what our clients ex expect from me um, with regard to kind of turning, you know, the data into actionable insight through consulting. Basically starting off at that vantage point, you know, from her voice and then kind of using that to say, you know, hey, like this is the challenge that I had. I accepted it because I seek to grow as a person. And then I outlined every single thing, well, the steps that I took to um, really improve. So it wasn't just, hey, here's the feedback. It's like, this is what I did to improve. And I wrote it in a way that was interesting and that could keep the reader. Uh, what's your best tip to keep the reader's attention? What do you think that, that is? I think it's like the first line. And again, this goes back mm, to 
Mm. This goes back to your podcast, <laughs> um, one of your podcasts. Yeah, I think it's like the first line. I tried to figure out a way to really draw people in through the first line. Um, it didn't have to be something like outlandish, but it just had to be something interesting that would keep you, you know, reading. And I made sure that um, I read it to other people. And um, so just to kind of see what they got from the story, like what parts of my, you know, I guess, personality or the characteristics, like which characteristics am I, you know, showing or portraying through this essay? So I, I really did take that time to make sure that others read it so that, you know, I can say, hey, OK, well, it looks like they're drawn in. So I'm doing a good job. But if it's like, oh, no, I don't get it, then it's like, OK, let's go back to the drawing board. Perfect. That's great. Yeah. Love to hear that. Oh, oh, makes me so happy. It's like, cause you didn't, you didn't share those essays in, in the admissions edge, but you know, it's great to just get more eyes on those essays and, 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 uh, yeah, like I just love the language you use, like see if, if it's drawing them in or not. And you can actually probably like give it to them over a coffee or something and just watch them, right? Watch their exactly. fa facial reaction. Like, Hmm. Exactly. I don't know about this or, oh yeah. yeah, that's really good. Like absolutely, just to get that live feedback. Yeah. So don't let your essays that you submit be the first ones anyone else has ever seen, right? Make sure you get, you get uh, some eyes on those. Love it. Love it. Love it. And uh, yeah, any last tips or encouragement you have for, for listeners? Um, you were once in their shoes. I know. Um, I mean, what I would say is just to really just trust the process. And you kind of hear that a lot, <laughs> kind of going through the process and, you know, going through applications and interviewing and, you know, waiting. It's like just kind of trust it and trust that you've done, you know, your best um, throughout that process. So, of course, bringing your best really does help to kind of confirm that you did your best, <laughs> you know, at the end of the game. So it's kind of like, you know, just understanding that it is what it is at this point. You're, you're, you're doing this for a reason and just make sure that you keep those reasons close to your heart and let it shine, you know, throughout. Love it. Thank you so much, Sabina. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Great. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your journey with us. I wish you all the best at Michigan Ross. Thank um, you. I'm so pumped for you. And I'm also going to plug our ambassadors forum because you have graciously volunteered to kind of share your experience and answer questions there, you know, for people who might be interested in Ross. So yeah, you can ask Sabina your questions at ambassadors.touchmba.com and course I'll, I'll definitely try to get you back on the podcast when you're an extremely busy MBA student to hear how your experience is going but uh, I can't wait and I'm, I'm so pumped for you thank you so much I appreciate it and again thank you for um, starting touch MBA and admissions edge and all of that good stuff it's it's been really helpful so I appreciate that so thank you <laughs>Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.